You are Locked On Wolverines, your daily podcast on the Michigan Wolverines, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Happy Wednesday. We're back and doing it. Locked On Wolverines podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every day. I am your man on the ground, Isaiah Hole, publisher of Wolverines Wire through USA Today Sports Media Group. And we have a uh, we have a big episode here. We're bringing on a first time guest. Uh, you certainly know his name. Uh, I've yet to talk to him at this point, but Mike Golick Jr., the uh, the son of Mike Golick. Both Golicks are very famous Notre Dame people, and uh, also he obviously does a whole bunch of stuff. So super excited to bring him on. He is certainly making the rounds because I was listening to Sirius XM. Uh, yesterday when my power was out, I was sitting in the car charging my phone up for a while and I heard him there and I go and see that he's on X's and bros with Anthony Bellino this morning. So he is making the round. So I'm very excited to, uh, to bring him on. Uh, but, uh, we will get to him in the middle, but here at the outset, uh, we spoke to Jay Harbaugh and George Hilo today and, uh, they discussed, Safeties, special teams, and linebackers. So these are position groups that we don't know a heck of a lot about necessarily um, as far as from the coaching perspective. But I I mean, these are position groups that I'm relatively excited about because I think that they're going to go a lot better than what a lot of people might think. I think they'll be... Linebacker in particular is crucial to this team's success. I mean, people talk about the... And this has been the thing in Ann Arbor for a long time. You know, the, the pass rush in the corners... Uh, but I, to me, the, that middle of the field is really important. That said, I don't feel like they said that much when it came to those position groups. Jay probably said a bit more about special teams, which makes sense. I mean, they had the number one special teams in the country last year. And it's uh, it, it's a position group that it's it, it really could help change games, right? Um, and that, that goes for, you know, difference between punting kicking field goals, returning. Uh, it, to refresh your memory, A.J. Henning is staying on punt, but uh, Roman Wilson is going to get his start uh, doing kicks. So I'm excited to see what that looks like, right? Because he very well might be the fastest player on the team, and he earned that position. But uh, I don't feel like there was anything like groundbreaking, and maybe part of it is, hey, it's the start of the season. Jim Harbaugh said kind of all there is to say. It's, it just kind of feels like we're ready to see it at this point. We are ready to see it. Uh, the, 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 there were two players that I want to know more about that I haven't heard much about, and I asked them both, and they both kind of didn't have a lot to say about either of them except for uh, one of them seems like he, he he's in the mix at safety and is a stalwart special teams player like he was last year. That's Quentin Johnson. We heard a lot about him in the spring. He, he was mentioned, especially when we'd ask players, like who's really standing out at safety, Quentin Johnson's name came up pretty much every time, but he was not mentioned by Jim Harbaugh. Jay Harbaugh says, "Hey, he's he's probably like fourth or fifth, so right there with Caden Colasar, but for an uh, you know an All American high school player uh, who made his commitment at the All American Bowl, four star guy from the DMV, you kind of would hope that he'd be a little bit further along." Plus, he looks like my old bassist, so I have an affinity for him. He does the Ambry Thomas uh, look at the camera. It's, it's not it's not like he always poses, right? He always is doing something like this uh, for those who can watch on video. But it's um, whereas Ambry would just kind of make eye contact and sometimes he'd point at me or whatever. But uh, my favorite was still when uh, in the Michigan, Michigan State game in 2017, he lined up for a, a point after field goal and uh, did the uh, the hit squad from uh, Martin Luther King High School. Did that. And I'm like, <laughs> you are going to get in so much trouble, Amber, if uh, Jim Harbaugh looks back and sees that on film. But uh, anyway, Quentin Johnson is in the mix. But the other one is Jaden Hood. And uh, it, it doesn't sound like he's necessarily in the mix. Not as much as like we've heard some things about these freshmen. Jimmy Rolder, Deuce Spurlock, Micah Pollard. Micah Pollard got like a little bit of extended time when Jim Harbaugh was talking about him on Saturday. Maybe that's just the excitement factor of being a freshman, but like year two, four star from Florida, you would hope that Jaden Hood is a little bit further along than he is. 
So uh, you hope that he can figure some things out, but Joe Archilo says, hey, he needs to figure some things out on special teams. So that might be the, the inroads, and you never know what's going to happen in the, in the midst of a season, right? Because we knew that David Ajabo was going to play last year. No one knew that he was going to start and would get 11 sacks, you know? So you hope that uh, maybe one of those guys, like it's like Jaden Hood, gets a couple special teams snaps in the first couple weeks, starts to feel comfortable out there, maybe gets into some garbage time, starts to figure things out, maybe gets a little bit more regular playing time. You never know what's going to happen. That said, it does seem like he's a little bit further out than uh, Quinton Johnson. But uh, otherwise, I don't think there was anything particularly groundbreaking. I just feel like we are all in this position even though it still seems surreal that the season starts in a couple days, it's surreal to sit here and think like I'm going to be watching Penn State Purdue in just over just over a day's time here that we are this close. That football is about to happen. We've talked about it for months on end. Now it's just time to see it. So I'm excited to see what that looks like because honestly, to some degree. I, I have some confidence. I have some some things that I, I feel like I know. But at the same time, I, I feel like we don't know anything until we see it. So excited for that to get here. All right, up next, we're going to have Mike Golick Jr. He's going to come on, and he is going to discuss uh, everything that we need to know uh, about, uh, about his... Well, not necessarily everything you need to know. We're going to talk to him about Michigan his perception. I obviously want to hit on Notre Dame, Ohio State, his expectations there as well, uh, college football at large. So we will get to that here in just a moment. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. Find all of the latest football league developments, game matchups, news, and podcasts, including this year's opening week games. BetOnline is also your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite sports and events, including Major League Baseball, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. But online, where the game starts. All right. Different perspective camera-wise. Thanks to some technical difficulties. Speaking of technical difficulties, we were supposed to have him on yesterday, Tuesday, but because of DTA Energy's inability to uh, have power in much of Michigan, Mike Golick Jr. joins us today. Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Thanks for having me, and just in general, glad to hear that you've got power back. Always a good thing. And you, you pro- well, you probably wouldn't know because I was keeping in touch with Sammy. It was just yesterday. I was like. Oh, it's gonna gonna be back. They, they're saying, "Oh, you're gonna have it back. You're gonna have it back." And waiting and waiting, and eventually, it, had, it was like, oh, "I gotta pull the plug." There's no way. This, I mean, someone quite literally pulled the plug on you. So that's really out of your hands on that. Ironically, the same thing happened to me. I was supposed to record with ESPN's Jason Fitz on Sunday, and someone pulled the plug on Power in Central Connecticut. So something weird's going around. It's too damn hot for everybody right now. <laughs> that it is. That it is. So. Uh, Obviously, I want to get your perspective on uh, Ohio State, Notre Dame, you being a Notre Dame guy, legacy, all of that, that that's you're going to have way better insight into that than I ever could. But being a national guy, you, you obviously have whatever your thoughts are on Michigan. And I'm curious as to what you think this Michigan team will be, because we that cover the team locally, that see them every day, all seem to have think of this team as really highly thought of right and we we think that they're this is going to be a really good team nationally it's kind of up and down as far as the way people are looking at this wolverines team so what overall what are what is your perspective of michigan Uh, my perspective of michigan is they're going to be a really good football team i don't think they're going to be as good as last year's team and i think the ohio state they're going to face is better so it's weird that you could have a team that's not as good as last year, but could have a similar record because the rest of the schedule is, I think, pretty light, especially in the beginning, so much so that Jim Harbaugh can use the first really three games as a scrimmage to figure out which quarterback he wants to pull out of the Bible. And 
I, I just think that overall it's always been for me with Michigan because I was one of the ones in a, you know, a couple of years ago when we were talking about the Jim Harbaugh that had to take a reduction in pay to come back and be the coach for Michigan to have the type of season we had in 2021. And the Jim Harbaugh that a lot of people wanted to run out of town after 2020 that I looked and said, well, what about all these double digit win seasons that you've had for the first four years of the tenure or so that's really hard to do in college football, but the measuring stick seems to always be for programs that have a chief rival inside their conference is what are you relative to blank? And for Michigan, that answers Ohio state. And for Michigan last year, it was a great time because they were able to finally slay that dragon. They're not slaying that dragon this year. Michigan could rebound and be as good as we, you know, possibly want to believe they can be in Cade McNamara or JJ McCarthy could both be the Lord and savior. Your defense is going to take a step back losing Dax Hill and then both ed- edge pieces that you had last year and Aiden Hutchinson and David Jabo, like they're just not going to reload those quality of guys that easily on that side of the ball. And then you're facing an Ohio state team. That's eye to eye with Alabama as the two best teams in college football this year. So I'm pretty comfortable penciling that in as a loss for Michigan this year. And so then it's just a matter of, all right, now that that happened last year, if you lose to just an Ohio state team, that's probably going to spend its season making everybody look silly. Is this still something that you can be happy with results wise? If the rest of it looks the way that we believe it can with this Michigan schedule. See, I am one of two, I believe two, maybe three media members in this market local media guys who actually has picked Michigan to beat Ohio state again this year. And I'll, I'll tell you why. And it's, I think because as a lot of unproven, like extremely great talent, but of a lot, a lot of unproven pieces on their end, both sides of the ball, new defense. I just think Michigan's lines are going to be, uh, be superior, but obviously they play games for a reason, right? Like I, I say that all the time, just because I say it now, doesn't mean that like, the week of the game, I'm not going to pencil that in as like an obvious loss. You know, we could be talking about that as an obvious win uh, come November because we never know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, but, I, I think it is interesting, too, to consider when this game is played also, because you talked about the unproven commodity and the fact that we get this game at the end of the season means for Ohio State, you've brought in two coaches and I think the most crucial areas for that team based on what we saw last year offensive line and defensive coordinator. So Jim Knowles brings over a defense that I think stylistically is going to be a lot more of what we saw when Jeff Halfley was at the helm for Ohio state as D coordinator. Now at Boston college up around the line of scrimmage, going to certainly challenge you at and behind the line of scrimmage. I think Oklahoma state led in tackles for loss and stuff Raider was very highly ranked in college football last year with him at the helm. They're going to maybe mix up coverage even more. I heard someone the other day say they put two safeties back there on a couple of occasions during training camp, which is wild, as you know, for anyone who's ever faced Ohio State defensively. And then on the other side, Justin Fry comes over from UCLA. And if you remember early in last season, UCLA's O-line absolutely going murder ball on LSU in a matchup that stunned all of us nationally a little bit for Chip Kelly and those guys. And the one common denominator with both of those kinds of hires is those are units that take a little bit of time to gel, even when you've got talent like it's going out of style in Ohio State. So I will be fascinated to see like Notre Dame facing them week one to me is a mightily different task than Ohio State and Michigan squaring off at the end of the year, where if your lines stay healthy, if you've got continuity on those units, the chain of command and the communication that you need to be successful in both those spots could take hold by then. And this Ohio State thing could look even scarier by then, or it could be one of those scenarios where maybe it's going to be a multi-year thing before those techniques and teaching points really start to set in because especially defensively, it's a very different thing having a voice at the top of that defense that's different from what you've had the last few years. And and speaking of, because I, I would imagine as a Notre Dame guy, you're looking at this game and you're like, please, Marcus Freeman, find a way. And I think probably most Michigan people would agree with you on inside with Notre Dame and kind of one of those rare rivalry, you know, we're going to take, we're going to take that and, uh, and run with it. Although recruiting wise, maybe not because Marcus Freeman is certainly getting a lot of guys at Michigan, yeah. but Notre Dame is not getting a lot of respect when it comes to this game. Uh, you know, every, every national prediction I've seen has had Ohio state uh, double digit 
favorite in, in this one. What is your view of this game and how can Notre Dame potentially take down the Buckeyes on Saturday night? Yeah, I want to be clear at this point. Like, if you ask me as an unbiased analyst, I'm picking Ohio State to win that game. Like, they should win that game. And I say that, like, Notre Dame, it won't be because they've lost the game. I think Marcus Freeman, what we saw, and this was the Fiesta Bowl, what we saw this take place in, Marcus Freeman's actual first shot as a head coach where came out extremely prepared, came out and got off to an incredible start. You can say, well, it was with a veteran outfit that had already played a full season's worth of football, a little bit of a different prospect than having to form the team in your identity over the course of an offseason. But it wasn't a lack of preparation, and there certainly won't be a lack of similar talent, especially along the lines of scrimmage. Notre Dame has proven their ability to do that. They went out and rehired Harry Heastand, who was the offensive line coach when I was there, who's got a group now that benefits all the injury Notre Dame's offensive line went through last year. All the young guys that got on the field early and got that time now becomes a strength for a unit that if they can keep that top five healthy, I think can be a really strong group. You've got an All-American tight end. And so all of that formula-wise, if you are going to be Notre Dame and Marcus Freeman and pull off the upset in this scenario, because again, Ohio State is talent-wise, them, Georgia, you know, uh, uh, Alabama, and maybe like one other school on a given year, recruit at a level that is capable of winning a national championship and winning it consistently. There's not that many in college football right now. And so if you're Notre Dame, as you're trying to bridge that gap with the recruiting that Marcus Freeman has started to demonstrate, hey, I can break through that ceiling that Brian Kelly felt was there and thus left for LSU to go try and coach there. While he's busy breaking through that, how you're going to have to get through this game is I think a lot how Notre Dame approached playing Alabama in the CFP two years ago, meaning you got to lean on your strength up front while Ohio State is getting their stuff figured out on defense, getting their stuff figured out on the offensive line, cause chaos there, go ball control and try and take the air out of this game, be insanely efficient inside the red zone, touchdowns on every trip, and then you're going to have to have defense steal a possession because I, I think that Ohio State buzzsaw of a wide receiver group and quarterback room, those are NFL players. like. Marvin Harrison, Jackson Smith and Jigba, CJ Stroud, they're on loan from the NFL to this Ohio State college football team. And so while Notre Dame secondary gets built to the place where Marcus Freeman wants to see it get, you're going to have to rely on uh, an Isaiah Foskey led pass rush up front to go and try and take advantage of some good matchups they could have early in the year, harass the quarterback in that way. And then when the field shrinks in the red zone, you got to take the ball away once. You got to try and give your offense an extra possession and just get them sit. We need, if you're Notre Dame and you're going to win this, you need long extended TV shots of CJ Stroud and that offense sitting on the sideline, hands inside their jerseys, waiting for their turn, chomping at the bit, getting cold. Because right now with Tyler Buckner, unless he comes out and is the second coming of Brady Quinn and is lighting it up in a way that we didn't really see as a limited part of his game last year in the packages he was used, you're going to have to lean on your strengths early. And those are decidedly, running back, a quarterback with running ability, and an offensive line and tight end room that has long been the identity for Notre Dame football in the last decade cha decade and change. Well, that's how, uh, that's how Michigan managed to beat Ohio State yeah. in large part last, last year. So we'll see if that, uh, if, if that formula can work again in hostile territory. I cannot wait to watch that game. I got to ask, how cool, how much fun was it and I was a late, a late adopter to, to actually going and watching the uniform reveal video in Las Vegas. <laughs> but to, to reenact one of my favorite movies, The Hangover, to go and do that, how much fun was that for you? Uh, it was a blast. And I am really thankful to Coach Freeman, um, the staff there, uh, everyone behind the scenes at Fighting Irish Digital Media, and Katie Lonergan, their uh, sports information director, for you know, letting us come be a part of it. It was an idea they pitched to us. They asked if we would be interested in coming and being a small part of it. And the execution from there on out, like as someone who, when I was in school there, 2008 to 2012, Fighting Irish Media was in its infancy. We were doing behind the scenes content on flip cameras in 2010. And now to walk into basically a feature film setup that they had out there with the entire crew in the desert helping us shoot that, was really cool to see. It was fun seeing the school embrace a different way to get this product out to people, to show in recruiting, hey, look at how creative we're willing to be with this stuff. 
and quite frankly, for Michael Mayer, for Isaiah Foskey, and for Coach Freeman to show off the acting chops. There's a future outside of sports if they ever want it there for a lot of those guys, and I think they got to put some good stuff on tape. Well, as a uh, someone who has a film degree from the University of Michigan, I'm envious that that is a thing that happened at Notre Dame. Uh, perhaps uh, I should have uh, stayed with film and then I could have pitched that to Michigan, uh, that type of thing. And I'll tell you what, I love seeing Isaiah Foskey in anything. I interviewed him back in 2016 when Michigan did its uh, satellite camps. Uh, he, he was at the Sacramento camp and he was a tight end at that time. And and uh, he was still, I think it, he was going into his sophomore year of high school or something like that. It was it was crazy. So it's awesome to seeing him have, seeing him have that success. Mike, where can people catch you this weekend? I know you're kind of all over the place. Yeah, uh, got an exciting weekend. So I'm doing uh, college football radio for Learfield. Going to be a part of that crew with Sloan Martin. And we are heading to Gainesville. We're going down there, Utah, on the road at Florida to start the Billy Napier era. You got UConn and Kyle Whittingham, or excuse me, Utah and Kyle Whittingham's crew coming in. Their highest preseason AP poll ranking ever. They're seventh in the country. They're a legitimate playoff contender. And we all watched what they did against Oregon at the end of last season when Cam Rising and that offense are in full meat grinder mode. They can make life miserable for pretty much anyone. So it's a tall task for Billy Napier in Florida trying to start off this new regime. But it's a game that uh, promises to be physical and feature a lot of rushing attempts. So get ready. Well, awesome. Uh, Definitely. uh, I'll obviously be trying to catch as much of that game as I possibly can. Uh, after Michigan's uh, Michigan's game and everything. So excited that you are going to be down there. Uh, thank you for so much for joining us. Hopefully we'll, we'll be able to have you back sometime midseason. We'll get to kind of figure out what Michigan is a little bit more, get, figure out what Notre Dame, Ohio State, all of it, and try to see kind of a progress report of everything we talked about today. It's a beautiful thing, man. We get to finally do it for real. No more talking, no more silly season. It's time to kick the damn ball off and do this. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Mike. Appreciate you. Thanks, man. All right, again, big thanks to Mike Golden Jr. Super excited to have him on. Very cool. It will be interesting to see what happens this weekend in particular with uh, Ohio State and Notre Dame. Listen, there, there's going to be optimism for every team heading into the season. I, I think there should be more Ohio State pessimism, to be honest. I really do. Because I I know they just reload all the time, but... That happens for every team until it doesn't. And with what Jim Harpaugh said after the Ohio State game this last year, the some some guys uh, are born on third and think they hit a triple. I know it draws the ire of Ohio State fans, but he's not wrong. That isn't to say that Ryan Day can't come out and start hitting home runs over and over and over again, but he didn't build that program. He was a steward of that program. And there's always a chance for a step back. We just aren't used to seeing Ohio State do that, right? We're used to seeing Ohio State just, okay, they're really good. and well, The next year, they're going to be better. The expectations are higher. All of that. That's what we are accustomed to when it comes to Ohio State. But at some point, uh, I, it's, it might not be this year, might not be next year, might not be for 10 years, might be not be for 15, 20 years. But at some point in their future... It, and it could be this year, could be next year, could be at any point. At some point, they're going to come out and it's they're going to have super high expectations and they're going to fall completely flat. Last year was kind of close to that, right? But, I mean, 10-2 and two isn't really completely flat. That's just like a Michigan-esque year. You know what I mean? So, this year when I look at Ohio State, as confident as I am that they will probably have a really good offense and the defense will improve. All it takes, and we've seen this with Michigan time and time again, and I'm not wishing this upon them, but I'm just saying this is the game of football. Key injury here or there, everything changes. Now, Ohio State has always tended to fall upwards, right? They have a key injury. They have Braxton Miller gets injured in the preseason. They bring in JT Barrett, who ends up being incredible. Then he gets injured in the Michigan game, and Cardell Jones comes in and helps win that game and then a national championship. Jim Trestle's forced out. 
it's like, oh, man, where are they going to go from here? And then they get Urban Meyer. They fall upwards. That's just what this program has tended to do. Now, I don't think they'll fall upwards if Michigan goes and beats them again because I can't imagine that Ryan Day would survive that, even if they're 11-0 and going into that game. Barring them being 11-1, and and non-Big Ten champion, going to the playoff regardless. Maybe it's 11-1 and and they are a Big Ten champion still and go and win the whole thing, but you lose to Michigan, then that might be the only way he would save his job in that case. But uh, I, I just, I'm curious as to what point, because I don't really like their defensive talent. They do have a lot of defensive talent. They do. But I just don't think it necessarily matches what they're trying to do. Now, that said, they can surprise people just like Michigan surprised people last year. But I, when I say surprise people, surprise me, right? <laughs> because most people think, oh, it's going to be great. Like I said before, it's like Ohio State gets a new defensive coordinator. It's like, oh, it's going to be so good. Michigan gets a new defensive coordinator. It's like, oh, it's not. It's not going to be very good. It's just funny how that works. <laughs> but I, I just think that if there was going to be a year where they could take a step back, it's this one. And it's partially because they do have a new defensive coordinator trying to figure things out. He historically has not been great in year one. He hasn't most historically come in and just suddenly like changed everything. It takes him a couple years. I'm not loving their defensive talent compared to uh, to some previous years. I think their offensive line will be good, but I don't. I think people are overrating it a little bit. It will still be like a top ten offensive line in the country, but I don't like everyone seems to have them as a clear cut number one. I don't. I'm not seeing that. I think Travion Henderson will be very good. I think CJ Stroud will be very good. I think Jackson Smith and Jig will be very good. But I, what happens if it just doesn't coalesce? What happens if Ryan Day is playing tight? Especially because they've got a really tough schedule this year. Notre Dame, Wisconsin, Iowa. Still the usual suspects. Michigan, Michigan State, Penn State. It would not surprise me in the least... If Ohio State took a step back. Now, step back is probably still 10-2 and two for them. I don't think they'll be Clemson of this last year, right? But if they were, it wouldn't surprise me. C.J. Stroud thought he played really good. I think that their receiving core looks probably really good. But Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson, those were first-round draft picks. What happens if Marvin Harrison Jr. had a great game against uh, Utah? Ends up being above average, but that's about it. What if it's just Jackson Smith and Jigba? What if Jackson Smith and Jigba doesn't benefit from having Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave out there with him a lot of the time? There are a lot of questions. And that's the beauty of college football, right? Again, I'm not predicting that they will take a step back. I am not. I fully expect them to roll through their schedule, unfortunately. But that's the beauty of college football. You never know. There's always this, the teams that are good are always going to be good, except unless it's Michigan. And the teams that are bad are always going to be bad, especially if it's Michigan. That's just where we're at at this point in the season. But we already saw in week zero how quickly things can change because Northwestern, a team that I had, I think, 13th in my power rankings. Nebraska, who I had 8th. It, it it goes a certain way and things change. You know Marcus Freeman wants to go in and win this game in Columbus. And it's going to take a lot more than wanting to to make it happen. But being an alum of Ohio State, he's being told from every which way that there's no chance. All the score predictions I've seen some, so far have been Ohio State somewhere in the 40s, Notre Dame somewhere in the 20s. What if he finds the elixir? What if Michigan gave the blueprint as to how to beat Ohio State? And what if Notre Dame has the guys that can do it? What if Isaiah Foskey, the Sacramento-based, formerly a tight end, I interviewed him back in 2016. What if, uh, what, what if he ends up just living in the Ohio State backfield? It could change everything. What if they run all over him? I don't know. I think it's a, it's a tough proposition. 
But I think there's tougher ones out there. Utah State at Alabama. But in a lot of these games, I, I just look around, up and down, and I, I think a lot of these games will be interesting. We'll learn a lot. From Utah, Florida, Georgia, Oregon. I don't think they're all necessarily like, yeah, this is obvious. <laughs> Alabama at Texas in week two. Yeah, that's probably pretty obvious, but it'll all be very interesting. All right, that's going to do it for us today. We have the mailbag coming up on Thursday. So get your questions in. I posed the question on Twitter. So reply to that and I will uh, we'll get you in for the mailbag. So thank you for watching and or listening. We'll be back very soon. Peace.